Hi, my name is Amy Sullivan, and I'm the chair of the AAAR Endowment Committee. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 13th in our monthly series of ASNT lectures. This is a new initiative for AAAR, being supported by the Freelander Memorial Fund. So, with these lectures, we hope to provide the opportunity to um, present the amazing research happening in our community. Um, to also give us the opportunity to come together outside of the annual conference and also to tie our journal to other activities. So each month, the editors of ASNT select a high impact journal article to be presented by its authors. Um, these lectures are being recorded and they'll be posted later to um, AAAR's new YouTube channel, which you can access on the AAAR website under the events tab. In addition, each month, one of our student chapters is serving as host. And so I want to thank everyone who's helped to make these lectures possible and all of you for joining us. And so with that, I'll turn it over to our student chapter from the University of Florida to get us started. Thanks. Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. I'm Brad Vass. Um, I am part of the University of Florida AAAR chapter and I'll be hosting today with Azad Madhu who will be leading the Q&A sec section, but um, I, will, I will head the introductions and so we'll jump right into that. Um, today we've got two speakers on our presentation. And so I'll, I'll start with Lauren McCarthy, who's a, a final year PhD student at the University of Bristol School of Chemistry. Um, she's working with Professor Jonathan Reed. She also received a integrated master's degree in chemistry from the University of Bristol in 2016. Lauren is aligned with the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, the Center, Center for Doctoral Training in Aerosol Science and undertook the core aerosol science training in 2019. Lauren's research explores the emission and deposition of biologically relevant aerosol. This includes the investigation of exhaled aerosol generated by musical performance, as well as the development of a high frame rate Im imaging technique to observe the impact dynamics of droplets on surfaces. And today she'll be joined by um, Dr. Flo Gregson, um, who is a postdoctoral postdoctoral research fellow at the University of British Columbia and Vancouver, Canada. She currently works in Alan Bertram's group studying the phase behavior and diffusion rates of wood smoke aerosol in the context of forest fires and biomass burning organic aerosol. Previously, Flo received her PhD from the University of Bristol in 2020 in Jonathan Reed's group, which involves studying the evaporation rates and crystallization kinetics of aerosol droplets for spray drying applications. She then did a year of postdoctoral research in the same group in Bristol, sampling aerosol generated through respiratory emissions or through medical procedures in the context of aerosol transmission of COVID-19. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Gregson to um, start us off on this presentation. Thank you all very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation for Lauren and I to talk to you all today. So I'm going to talk about um, sampling respiratory aerosol and it's very important to, um, to sample respiratory aerosol as they serve as the um, as a vehicle for the airborne transmission of, of pathogens. And um, certain properties of respiratory aerosol have carry inherent challenges with their sampling. So I'm gonna start um, with the talk today by discussing these properties of respiratory aerosol and the inherent challenges of their detection, um, mainly describing the first paper that's listed here in the second bullet point. And then I'm going to hand over to Lauren, who's going to follow up with the results from um, two papers in which we discuss the results of sampling respiratory aerosol generated by um, singing, speaking and breathing, and then from woodwind and brass instrument playing. Um, this work was, um, was all uh, carried out as part of the PERFORM project, which is um, highlighted here in red. So the motivation of this work of studying respiratory aerosol really stemmed from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, where, during exhalatory events, particulate matter is expelled, not just um, large, large droplets that you might be able to see in the form of a cloud of emission, but also these smaller aerosol particles. And um, 
during the pandemic, early in the pandemic, there were a few clusters of COVID-19, particularly associated with choirs around the world. And unfortunately, this led to severe concerns about how much aerosol was generated through singing or through musical instrument playing, as that had not really been quantified before. And that led to restrictions on singing and woodwind and brass instrument playing around the world, which led to severe consequences in terms of culture, economics and people's well-being. So we set out to try to quantify the aerosol concentrations generated through singing or through playing musical instruments to try to understand whether these activities carried more risk in terms of more aerosol generation or whether the clusters of COVID-19 from, from choirs were more associated with, for example, um, being part of a group activity in, a, in an enclosed space uh, and sustained vocalizations. Prior to us carrying out this work, there were some really key pieces of work performed in the field of respiratory aerosol. So I'm just going to talk briefly about some previous literature. For example, in, in 2011, Johnson et al studied the aerosol generated through speech and through coughing, and they identified distinct modes in the size of aerosol generated through these activities. So for example, for coughing, the, this is um, reproduced from their paper, um, the y-axis is DND log dp, which is a measure of concentration as a function of particle diameter. And you can see that the droplets span orders of magnitude um, in terms of their size. And the, the particulate matter generated through coughing can be identified in distinct modes of size. For example, a, a mode uh, centered around about one micron arising from fluid film bursting in the bronchioles. Um, more aerosol generated from vibrations in the larynx, which is a slightly broader mode. And finally, the oral cavity mode. So much larger droplets arising from, um, from, from the mouth and that reach diameters up to about a millimeter in size. They also identified that speech generates the same three modes, except this laryngeal mode, the, the one I've highlighted in blue, um, is shifted to slightly higher diameters. And this is due to the vocalization making the larynx a bit more dominant in this, in this activity. Another piece of really important work prior to us carrying out this study was from Asadi et al in 2019, who studied the aerosol emitted through breathing and through speech. And they really identified the correlation between the loudness level and the amount of aerosol generated as shown in this figure on the left. But they also studied the aerosol generated from a large cohort of individuals and identified that the number of particles generated by different people follows a log normal distribution with some a small minority of people emitting a lot more particles than others who can be classed as super emitters. Um, I also want to acknowledge that a few other groups also studied um, the aerosol generated through singing or through um, musical instrument playing. And so I just want to highlight a non exhaustive list of some other pieces of work and I invite the I invite you all to, to take a look at their work afterwards. Um, so up until the pandemic, um, the aerosol generated through singing had not yet been studied and um, respiratory droplets have certain properties associated with them that carry challenges in their measurement. For example, respiratory droplets are very polydispersed in size. Um, as, as shown before, they span orders of magnitude in size and no one instrument can sample the whole range of, of particulate matter. Also, the droplets are generated in a, in a respiratory jet, and as such, they are very dynamic and very directional. Um, the minute they leave the warm, humid lung and enter a cooler um, environment and drier environment of a room, uh, they're subjected to a range of kinetic processes such as evaporation, um, sedimentation and dispersion. They're also very, very low in concentration and temporally variable. The way that we studied these, uh, sampled these respiratory droplets, it, and the way many other groups did this is through the use of a funnel system in front of a person's face, um, through which the aerosol droplets are then drawn, uh, passing into some conductive tubing, which then enters some sort of uh, commercial sampling instrument. For example, the optical particle sizer or the aerodynamic particle sizer. These instruments uh, sample the size resolved aerosol concentrations um, 
in, a, in, in, a, in, for example, single second resolution in time. The work presented here, um, we're going to report results from the aerodynamic particle sizer, the APS, which studies um, droplets ranging from 500 nanometers up to 20 microns. Uh, this is an important size range to look at, and the aerodynamic size is also um, the, a useful measure of size of these types of droplets because it's the aerodynamic size that relates to um, dispersion of a droplet around a room or, for example, deposition in the lung if they're inhaled. And also this size range that the APS can measure accesses most of the um, size modes um, of the droplets generated in the bronchioles and the larynx. Uh, in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic, the SARS-CoV-2 particle is around about 100 nanometers in diameter. Um, some diseases, it's been identified, for example, influenza, that um, more virus um, is, is found in the smaller droplets rather than the larger droplets. But in terms of, the, of, the, of SARS-CoV-2, this, this is not fully known yet, sort of which mode the aerosol is, is more likely to be um, to be concentrated in. So in the absence of this kind of robust measurement, really just counting the concentration of aerosol droplets in this, um, in this bronchial and laryngeal mode is, is really important in terms of assessing risk of airborne transmission of the disease. So I'm going to go through some of these properties of respiratory aerosol and uh, discuss why that makes it difficult to sample them. Um, the first being the fact that these droplets generated by, for example, singing are very, very low in concentration, typically lower than um, the pre-existing background aerosol concentration in a room. Uh, so we sampled the aerosol um, generated from, from respiratory processes in underneath the laminar flow system of an orthopedic operating theater. Um, so right in the middle of a hospital, they have these operating theaters that have an air exchange rate of around 500 to 600 air changes per hour of um, HEPA filtered air passing down from the ceiling. And this leads to a near zero background in terms of aerosol concentration. And that's really important for measuring respiratory droplets. Um, as shown in this figure here, particle concentration as a function of time. Um, we had a single subject cough three times. Initially, when the laminar flow system was fully operational, and you can clearly see the three peaks from the, from the coughs. Second, when we set the laminar flow to standby, so reduce the air exchange rate to around about 25, and you can still clearly resolve the aerosol generated from that respiratory emission. But when we turn the laminar flow off and the background rises, you can see that it's, it's basically impossible to really identify what aerosol was generated from those three coughs. Um, another aspect of this, um, of this property of being low in concentration is the importance of sampling for a really long time to try to quantify these particles. The accuracy in the sampled concentration increases with acquisition time. And this is particularly important for the larger particles in the laryngeal mode, which are very low in concentration. A way to think about this is to consider not counting aerosol particles, but standing next to a busy road and trying to count the frequency that a car passes you. If you're standing next to a highway or a really busy road, you only really need to stand there for about 30 seconds to gain a really good understanding of the frequency of cars. Whereas standing next to a very empty road, such as this one on the right, you'd probably have to stand for about a month to really quantify how often a car goes past. And it's, it's the same with the respiratory aerosol. So in this figure, um, the gray squares are sampling the background aerosol concentration in, uh, in a chemistry laboratory. Um, this is just as an example, but the size distribution is very similar to that of respiratory aerosol. So the, um, the pink squares then are sampling the same, the same aerosol background, but just over 20 seconds. And you can see that the smaller particles in this size distribution that are very large in concentration um, are very um, accurately quantified over just 20 seconds of sampling. But if we move to the larger particles, which um, are much lower in frequency, highlighted by the y-axis, where I've actually plotted the number of particles sampled per minute, you can see that 20 seconds of the pink diamonds is just not enough time to quantify these droplets, uh, in this instance, the aerosol. 
but it's the same in uh, in terms of um, respiratory aerosol from generated from speech. So in this figure, I've plotted the um, the size distribution of aerosol from speech as reported by Johnson et al. And the the red the bold red line is uh, the fit that they they provided to their data points. It's a log normal fit. And um, it's a fit to data points. And I've just highlighted one of their data points that they used in the fit, which is this X here. And that's actually the largest particle they sampled and at the lowest concentration of seven times 10 to the minus six per particles per cm cubed. And actually this concentration sampling with an APS means sampling one particle once every 76 hours. Um, it's it's basically impossible to have a single subject speak consistently for 76 hours. So this highlights the real importance of the real challenges with measuring, especially these larger droplets in these size distributions. Um, if I convert the, uh, the concentration here into a cumulative concentration plot for this size range, you can see that um, not accurately quantifying these larger particles as indicated here um, by the X on, in the right axis, doesn't really matter in terms of quantifying the number of droplets um, generated by speech, because by, by, by the time you reach this larger size, you've quantified 99% of all droplets. But in fact, in terms of the mass concentration, that there's still potentially 20% of error um, through not sampling for long enough, for example, for these larger particles. So this is a real challenge with respiratory aerosol. In addition, the, um, the, the aerosol generated through respiratory activities has an inherent flow rate, an exhalation flow rate. And it's really important to try to understand the, the relationship between the flow rate of the exhalation with the flow rate of the sampling instrumentation, especially if you're using some kind of funnel setup as we were. Um, it's, it's very difficult to know exactly what the exhalation flow rate is. Um, so it's, it's usually best to just try to understand which regime you're working in. Um, so I'm going to define two different cases, one being where the exhalation flow rate is greater than the sampling flow rate, so case one. And in this instance, we form a steady state of respiratory droplets, a steady state concentration in the funnel that is then slowly um, sampled by the lower flow rate sampling instrument. So in this instance, we are not sampling all the particles and therefore can only report the concentration of aerosol in the exhaled jet. I am going to, um, I'm going to demonstrate this in terms of data. So we were fortunate actually to, to sample once the exhalation flow rate of a subject singing and they were singing at a flow rate of 27 liters per minute. The APS is sample at five liters per minute. So in this instance, we're definitely in case one and the APS sampled a um, concentration of around about 1.2 particles per centimeter cubed. We were then lucky to have access to some more APSs. So we actually increased the flow rate of the sampling instruments by hooking up more APSs until we actually had five APSs sampling from the same funnel. Um, so all drawing at five liters per minute. So sequentially increasing a flow rate from five liters per minute to 25 liters per minute. And the figure on the top, you can see when I plot in terms of concentration, the APS still always records the same concentration pretty much within the error because we are still within case one. Uh, if we instead think about counting the particles and not sampling a concentration, but just summing the particles, um, you can see that we don't get the correct data if we, um, if we sample with just one APS or any number of APSs below the, um, below the exhalation flow rate, because just if you continue to add more and more flow rate, you just sample more particles. So that would be the wrong way to consider how to report the data. You have to only report the concentration in the exhaled jet. A second case is in the instance where the exhalation flow rate is lower than the sampling flow rate. In this instance, you are drawing all aerosol that's generated into the sampling instrument. And therefore it's, it's not appropriate to report a concentration, but rather to report absolute counts or a particle emission rate. 
So it's, it's important to understand which of these regimes you're working in. Um, in our instance, we um, were exclusively within case one, where the exhalation flow rate was larger than that of the sampling flow rate. So that's why when I hand over to Lauren shortly, she's only going to present data in terms of a concentration of aerosol droplets in the exhalation flow. Uh, the final thing uh, I'm going to talk about today before handing over to Lauren is um, the, the subject of evaporation of respiratory droplets. Because when droplets are generated from the lung, a very, very humid and very warm environment, um, they are immediately subjected to um, the possibility of evaporation as they travel out into a room. Um, so we modeled the evaporation rate of a, um, of a saliva formulation of different particle sizes using the hygroscopicity of saliva and the um, and an evaporation rate model as reported in Walker et al. So uh, the figure on the right is uh, different starting sizes. In fact, these are the bins in, in an APS and how long it takes for these different uh, diff droplets of these sizes to evaporate if they exit the lung and enter into a room of, of ambient indoor conditions. And you can see that the larger droplets of around about 20, 20 microns take about a second to equilibrate to a final particle radius. Whereas the sub-micron aerosols um, actually evaporate very quickly and reach an equilibrated radius within only tens of milliseconds. And so this can have quite a drastic effect on the size distribution of what's being sampled. So again, I've reported here the size distribution of the bronchial and laryngeal mode of aerosol generated by a cough from Johnson et al. And the pink diamonds here are the initial droplet size, um, size distribution as if they've just been generated. And then we modeled how the evaporation would affect this size distribution because the smaller droplets actually evaporate very quickly and immediately reach a equilibrated size, whereas the larger droplets take much longer to get to that point. And so it almost looks like there's a third mode that's been formed here, whereas that's just caused by lack of equilibration time. And then as you go through time, eventually the larger droplets catch up and we have the same size distribution, just about a third of the size smaller. It's important when sampling respiratory aerosol to understand whether this process is happening in, in a sampling setup or not. So in our, in our experiments, because we use this funnel setup and because the exhalation flow rate was greater than the sampling flow rate, um, we uh, aimed to limit the amount of room air mixing in the funnel uh, to therefore avoid this evaporation process because the aerosols are generated in a humid plume of, of air from the lungs. Um, whereas other groups who have sampled respiratory aerosol uh, deliberately try to sample downstream to enable evaporation to fully take place and then they correct for it later. So just to summarize, the properties of respiratory aerosol make the, make the sampling of a size distribution um, very challenging. And this is, um, this, the point of this talk is just to demonstrate these challenges and how we tried to overcome them. Um, for example, we sampled in an area of as low background and for as long as possible to account for how low in concentration these droplets are. Uh, in this instance, that involved us sampling in a laminar flow operating theatre. Um, it's also very important to understand the flow rates of an exhalation flow as respiratory droplets are generated and how that relates to the flow rate of the sampling instrumentation to try to keep a step in our instance we tried to keep a steady state concentration within the funnel. It's also important to understand the likelihood that evaporation is taking place of the aerosol prior to sampling and in our instance we tried to avoid that by preventing room air mixing. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Lauren, who's going to um, talk to you about how, um, how we sampled respiratory aerosol in, in the context of singing and the results from singing and musical instrument studies. Thanks, Flo. Um, so great. Flo gave a really nice um, kind of overview of the, the sort of challenges that, um, that kind of occur with uh, these types of measurements. So now I'm going to um, just talk about the results that, um, that we collected from, from these studies. 
Um, so today I'm going to be discussing results from two um, cohorts of participants. Um, the first was a cohort of 25 professional singers, and the second was a cohort of nine professional instrumentalists who played a mixture of brass and woodwind instruments. Um, and these um, professional instrumentalists self-identified as amateur singers, um, and I'm going to discuss that um, just once I start looking through the, the results with you. Um, so we adopted a standard operating procedure as we wanted to keep um, the measurements consistent between participants. Um, we asked participants to repeat a particular activity multiple times and um, between each repeat we had a 30 second pause in between where we would have the participants step away from the sampling funnel so that we didn't get any contamination um, during that kind of background activity. Um, we got the participants to um, carry out a range of activities, so this um, involved um, various speaking and singing um, activities, which was um, across various um, sound volumes. Um, there was also um, breathing and coughing, and then um, in addition to all of the above, the instrumentalists also played um, a single note on their instrument um, nine different times, so this was at three different sound volumes and at three different um, note ranges. Um, and we also um, had a decibel meter as part of the setup, which is just this um, sort of red uh, box here that you can kind of see in the corner. And we had this um, sort of eye level with the participants so that they were able to self-regulate their own sound volume. So um, as Flo was um, discussing, it's really important when doing these measurements to have um, a zero background, which is why we took out took um, these measurements in a laminar flow operating theater. And this is an example time series um, of some data from one participant during um, all of their activities. And you can see that there's a really clear zero background in between uh, the repeats of their activities when they're carrying, carrying these out. Um, this means that we can really clearly um, attribute these peaks to the participant activity because it's occurring when we know that the activity was occurring. Um, and it's also really good because we have um, nice short and um, rise and fall times of the peaks, um, which makes the analysis um, easy. Um, so um, when we carried out the analysis, we integrated um, under each peak um, and then we divided the integral by um, the time that they carried out the activity for. And then once we had um, a time averaged um, concentration for each repeat, we then also took an average of the repeats, um, which gave us one um, value per participant per activity. Um, so if we kind of first look, um, just a brief overview of the kind of results um, from these 25 professional singers. Um, so here we have number concentration um, plotted as a box and whisker plot. So we have um, the mean um, in the middle here, and then we have the median as a line. Um, so we have here the speaking and singing um, results from this cohort. So speaking in white and singing in gray. And um, this first set of data here is from all five, all 25, sorry, um, participants from this cohort. And then we have um, sort of subcategories of that cohort here um, sort of plotted further along. Um, so when we compared the data from the full cohort, we didn't really see any differences um, that kind of stood out in any of these subcategories um, of the participants. Um, so this meant that we were then able to kind of treat the cohort as a whole and um, that meant we could kind of just look at the, their results together and then instead just kind of compare across their activities. Um, so again, if we look at number concentration here, um, one of the first things that um, was obvious was that there was a log normal distribution um, amongst the, um, the cohort. Um, and this was uh, across all activities, we saw this log normal distribution. However, if we just look um, kind of in more depth here at, at, at breathing in particular. So here um, we've actually got a cohort of 118 um, adults, and this is across um, various performed studies that were carried out. You can see that breathing spans a really large range um, with, you know, spanning orders of magnitude. Um, and here we've just got a histogram um, where we've sort of binned um, the concentration that people generated during breathing. And you can see it is this very clear log normal distribution. 
Um, and we also saw the log normal, normal distribution across um, other activities as well. And kind of as Flo mentioned as well from the previous literature, we did also see a few participants who generated, um, you know, some really quite high concentrations um, that were quite a lot higher than uh, the kind of rest of the cohort. Um, so the kind of next thing that's interesting to look at with this data is um, if we compare across um, vocalizations. So here we have um, speaking and singing at three different volumes. And if we compare um, the two vocalizations at the same volume, um, we did see um, a, a modest enhancement in the uh, number concentration emitted uh, where we compared um, singing with speaking. Um, however, this enhancement was really um, kind of eclipsed by this really large dependence on uh, the sound volume. Um, so you can see here that um, an increase in the volume from the lowest to the highest um, is a much steeper um, increase than when we compare across the different vocalizations. So whereas um, comparing speaking with singing was only about two times difference, when we compared across the quietest to the loudest sound volume, um, you know, it was a sort of 10 times, uh, 10 times increase. So across an order of magnitude there. Um, so then if we kind of start to bring in the um, professional instrumentalists, um, we can see that the data um, across the two different cohorts seem to match really well. So here we have the breathing and speaking and singing. Um, so this kind of allowed us to um, perhaps make a conclusion that there was similarity between um, the professional and amateur singers, seeing as these um, instrumentalists self-identified as amateur singers. So then if we um, bring in the, um, the data from their playing, so this was playing a single note on their instruments. Um, so this is how we sampled um, the instruments. So we had the sampling funnel just, um, just at, uh, at the kind of end of their instrument and they would place the instrument inside the funnel. Um, and again, we did see um, this sound volume dependence on uh, number concentration here. Um, although we didn't necessarily see um, as steep a um, increase in number concentration with uh, sound volume. However, this could be to do with the fact that we accessed a narrower, narrower range of, um, of volume. So um, with the instrument playing, we simply asked them to play at piano or mezzo forte or forte. We didn't give them quite such strict uh, um, decibels to sort of aim for. And that was just because we wanted to see how the instrumentalists interpreted um, those kind of instructions as they would if they were playing a piece of music. Um, so that actually meant that um, we accessed, you know, between 80 and 100 decibels, whereas when um, the participants were um, vocalizing, this was, you know, between 50 and 100. Um, so that could account for why uh, this volume dependence isn't quite as steep. And then kind of the final thing to note with this number concentration data here is that um, even playing at the loudest volume, so Forte, um, that is still generating less aerosol than um, when we compare with the vocalizing at the highest volume. Uh, so then next, if we um, take a look at the flute and piccolo in a bit more detail. Um, so uh, for both of these instruments, the embouchure of the mouth is not um, fully closed um, while playing the instrument. So unlike the other instruments where we only sampled at the end of the instrument, we also chose to um, sample at the mouth while the participant was playing as well. So we had uh, two data sets um, from these instruments. Um, so we had three participants who played um, a flute and they also were the same participants uh, played a piccolo. And um, when we compared their number concentration from breathing uh, compared with their playing from both the mouth and the end, we found that there was a general trend uh, with playing and breathing. So you can see here that um, participant eight tends to be the sort of highest emitter um across breathing and playing and um, participant two tends to be this lower emitter um, so perhaps there's some kind of um, correlation between um, breathing and playing so then if we um, start to look at these um, size distributions um, so we did observe two overlapping modes which as Flo described uh, we know can be attributed to the lower respiratory tract and um, the larynx um, so just looking at this figure here, um, the main figure we have is um, 
DND log DP plotted against um, diameter, um, both in, in a log scale. And then um, we have the same data plotted here in the, in, um, in the inset, which is on a linear Y scale. And um, this data also shows our um, bimodal log normal distribution fits um, that we fit to the data. Um, so the first thing to kind of note here is that um, our speaking data, which is the, uh, the, the speaking at the lowest volume, or the, the mid volume, sorry, is uh, these pink circles here. And the shape of this distribution fits really nicely with the distribution that we uh, that we can see from uh, Johnson et al. Um, so this distribution from Johnson is a fit to their experimental data for speaking. Um, so it's really nice to see that these uh, shapes match each other. Um, then the next thing to notice is that um, the shapes for um, the vocalization distributions um, all seemed to be very, um, very similar. So the um, the midpoint, the mean uh, diameter and the uh, the width of the distribution um, was very similar across all four vocalizations. Um, however, that really wasn't seen um, with the breathing. So with this larger um, laryngeal mode, um, it wasn't quite as pronounced as the vocalization as you can see here. So this is a normalized version of this data. Um, and there really isn't um, as obvious a, uh, a mode here at this larger size. Um, so this was shifted to a smaller size and was also a narrower mode here. Um, and you know, perhaps this isn't surprising because um, the larynx um, is exercised during speech. So um, maybe unsurprising that we see this really nicely during vocalization and less so during breathing. Um, so then if we um, look at the size distribution for instruments, so this was um, across all, um, all of the instruments and this was measured at the end. Um, we can again see that um, playing is dissimilar to vocalization. So we can see here these gray squares. This is the vocalization and we have this really clear laryngeal mode. And um, where we see that drop off with breathing, we also see that again um, with playing, which are these uh, blue and red um, diamonds here. Um, so again, this supports the hypothesis that um, playing instruments could be um, similar to breathing. And that if someone um, breathes, you know, in a certain way, then that could be an indicator of uh, how they might emit uh, when they play. Um, and then if we um, look at mass concentration, um, which is a really useful tool, um, these are uh, inferred from the size distributions. And the first thing that we can see is that breathing has shifted down uh, relative to speaking and singing, um, breathing and playing, sorry. So um, whereas breathing here was maybe sort of very similar to what we were seeing for this mid volume for speaking and also uh, same for playing, um, these have shifted down. Um, and then the kind of next thing to notice is that this, um, this sound volume dependence on the concentration has um, become, uh, sorry, apologies, um, is now even more uh, pronounced. So um, whereas with number concentration, there was um, this, this uh, dependence, we can now see that it's even more steep and you know, it's uh, between uh, 20 and 30 times uh, what the lowest uh, volume is compared to the highest volume. Um, and both of these kind of um, these points are due to the fact that um, the vocalization induced laryngeal mode um, preferentially increases aerosol mass as these particles are larger. And then um, kind of just coming back to the point that um, Flo made um, when she was discussing um, viral load. Um, so although there's still kind of uncertainties about where the viral load kind of sits within the size distribution, um, if we were to assume that, um, you know, a higher mass um, means a higher um, viral load, then um, mass concentration can be a really useful tool in comparing risk um, as if there's a higher mass concentration, um, then that could potentially mean um, a higher risk. Um, and then just kind of finally, one of the last few um, things that we uh, that we did here, um, we um, wanted to look at these kind of larger oral droplets. Um, so the APS sampling range only goes up to 20 microns. So um, we were interested to see if there was anything that we would uh, be missing um, when we were considering droplets larger than that. 
So we used a water sensitive paper technique, um, which are these yellow cards here. Um, and we kept those um, 10 centimeters away from the mouth of the participant while they were um, coughing or singing, um, or 10 centimeters from the end of that instrument while they were playing. And um, just these smaller squares underneath the images of the cards here are um, just uh, a little crop of the above um, card. And um, you can see that um, from coughing and singing, there's some really obvious um, droplets. Um, so when a droplet impacts on these cards, um, there's a color change. And you can see here, there's some really obvious um, droplets for coughing and singing. Whereas we didn't observe any droplets um, using this technique um, for instrument playing. Um, this isn't to say that these droplets weren't emitted, it's just that we um, didn't observe them on the cards. Um, there's the potential that they possibly impacted um, on the instrument during, um, during the travel down the instrument. However, um, we're not able to say that. All we're able to say is that we didn't observe um, the, the uh, droplets um, impacting on these cards um, at the end of the instrument. And I just want to highlight that this is a kind of um, qualitative um, analysis um, of these larger droplets. And um, we have, in fact, uh, um, kind of moved on to looking at more of a uh, quantitative um, way to look at these larger droplets. Um, so now just kind of uh, to kind of summarize the results from these um, studies. So. Um, we saw modest enhancements in the aerosol concentrations in both number and mass when we compared vocalization types. So when we compared uh, speaking with singing. Um, however, we saw significant enhancements in the concentrations when we compared uh, vocalizing at different volumes. Um, so in mass concentration, you know, this was as much as 20 or 30 times um, larger for the loudest volume compared with the quietest volume. Um, another thing that we um, concluded was that playing is similar to breathing, and this was in both concentration and size distribution. And um, we also didn't observe any large droplets from playing or breathing. And although I've kind of highlighted these um, four conclusions here, I really just want to highlight that this was our really big um, take home message um, from this data, um, that there really was a very, a very pronounced um, dependence on um, sound volume with uh, aerosol concentration. Um, so I just wanna take um, just some time here to kind of just summarize um, the PERFORM study and kind of what's happened um, since we've been working on uh, the instruments and uh, the singing. Um, so in total, we had um, over 150 participants as part of this study, um, and this included 18 children. And um, since the papers that uh, Flo and I have discussed today, um, we've also, um, as a group, had um, two more papers published. Um, and this included um, looking at um, respiratory emissions from exercising and also um, comparing children and adults. And we've also submitted uh, two more papers um, looking at speech and language therapy. And uh, just as I mentioned before, um, these oral respiratory droplets and looking at them in a more um, quantitative way. And then um, finally, we're, um, we're currently in the process of analyzing some data from um, looking at surgical masks and also a larger cohort of instrumentalists. Lovely, so that um, brings me to my acknowledgement slide. And um, just before I thank all of these um, lovely people that we worked on this project with, I just want to say a massive thank you to Flo, who was absolutely amazing to work on this project. Um, so, you know, I kind of came along into this project at the very beginning of my PhD and Flo was absolutely wonderful to work with. She was a really great mentor and um, I learned so much from her um, during uh, this work. So thank you, Flo. It was really great. Um, and then obviously we had so many other people that worked on this with us and it was really great because um, it it was very um, collaborative and it, it spanned across many different institutions and um, kind of subject knowledge. Um, and then also to thank, um, you know, uh, these um, companies who gave us instrument loans and also um, some space for us to carry out our work. And then um, thank you to the, uh, the funding that we received from Public Health England um, and DCMS. Um, so I think that's everything from me. If anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to take them. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Uh, my name is Azad Madhu. I'll be hosting the Q&A.
So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in chat. I'll, I'll start reading the questions from chat. So the first question is, how can you prevent droplet coagulation in the collection funnel and in the tube from the funnel to the analyzers? Did you check laminar flow rates? And oh, there are three questions questions on this. So did you check laminar flow rates and did you check what is the critical size of these droplets? Um, I think that questions to me, I think I'll open the chat so I can actually see it written down. <laughs> that will be helpful. Uh, droplet coagulation in the collection funnel and in the tube. Um, we, didn't, we didn't look into the droplet coagulation um, aspect. We did discuss it. Um, partly the, the concentrations of the droplets are so incredibly low. Um, so we assumed at the rate that the um, sampling instruments were drawing aerosol from the funnel, we did not expect uh, coagulation of droplet sizes coming together in, in that sort of flow rate. Um, in the, what was the next thing? Did you check different laminar flow rates? I think that's referring to the laminar flow coming down from the ceiling. Um, so for all of the um, experiments that we undertook, we used the laminar flow system fully operational. So 500 to 600 air changes per hour in the room, um, just to make a clear zero background concentration. Um, but in the, in the data that I reported on that slide, we did practice um, sampling a subject coughing when the flow rate was slightly lower than that in terms of the laminar flow system. So that was an air exchange rate of 25 um, air changes per hour. And it did show um, the same concentrations of recorded um, respiratory aerosol within the error. So, um, Perhaps 500 to 600 was overly excessive, but it was very nice to ensure we had a completely zero background aerosol concentration. Um, did we check what is the critical size of these droplets? I'm not sure exactly what, what the, I don't really understand the question. What is, the, as in the critical size of what the APS can sample, I suppose. Um, I, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. The APS samples droplets within 500 nanometers to 20 microns. Um, but we didn't, we didn't collaborate, um, we didn't, um, I suppose we compared the results against that to an OPS and in terms of a DND log DP plot, the, the um, concentrations were the same. Um, I think that's all I can say with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question, the next question in chat, I believe this was already answered during the presentation. So I'll go, go to the next one. So uh, the next question is, what do you see as the pieces of measurement information still needed to improve quantification of the roles of aerosol in disease transmission? Uh, I'll kick off again, but Lauren can take over if she has something more to add. Um, thanks, Robert, for the question. Um, I think a really important piece of information we're still missing is this, sub this topic we touched on, which is which size range in terms of what's generated by by um, respiratory emissions has the largest viral load in um, for example th these larger droplets originating from the mouth um, that go up to an order of millimeters in size they carry so much of the total mass of respiratory fluid but the question is do those droplets with so much mass um, uh, that represents so much of the mass are they more does that mean they have more viral load if you inhale one of those is that you're more likely to um to um catch the respiratory pathogen or the smaller droplets and i think this has come from robert Lucida. i know that he was actually working on this topic it's so difficult to to quantify that um that aspect like trying to work out which size mode carries the largest viral load so I think that's something that's still really, really challenging. Yeah, I would agree. And, and also on top of that, um, I think, you know, all the results we've presented here have just simply been a measurement of aerosol concentration. Um, so since these studies, um, we've gone on to also measure the actual flow rate of participants while they've been um, measuring with the APS. So we've been able to combine those two results um, to then get 
a sort of absolute um, exhalation rate as opposed to just a concentration, because if someone's emitting at a very high flow rate, then we can't simply just take their concentration because that might not necessarily be a great um, sort of definition of whether they're a risk or not, because um, we don't know anything about their flow rate. So since these studies, we have um, we have measured um, minute ventilation of patients participants, sorry. Um, and so we have um, then been able to combine those two, as I say, and I think that gives a much better and clearer indication of risk um, for a particular participant. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, we have excellent information now regarding the size distributions of bioaerosol, but less on the production of infectious bioaerosol, such as the tr in translation from bioaerosol counts to viable viral load. Do you have any plans on exploring this? Sorry, I'm just reading the question. <laughs> Um, my first thought to this is that that's perhaps not our particular expertise. Um, I think, you know, our expertise definitely lies in um, the kind of aerosol sampling, um, not necessarily the kind of biological aspects of these um, aerosol. Um, yeah, Flo, I don't know if you had any, anything to add there. Um, yeah, it's not it's not exactly um, the project we worked on, but also in the in the same research group in Bristol, some researchers were looking at levitating um, bioaerosol in in um, in a electrodynamic balance, and then depositing the droplets and um, establishing then um, if they're still infectious after a period of time of levitating. So uh, there is work being done on this viability of infectious aerosol in the in the aerosol phase. Um, so yeah, I refer you to look at those papers. It's not exactly the topic that we worked on, but it's definitely a very important question. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, the next question is, how did you account for the cyclic nature of, of breathing? Flow rate changes throughout the breathing cycle. So at some points, the breathing, the sampling flow rate will be larger than the exhalation flow rate. Did you measure the flow rates coming out of the instrument and instrument belts and compare them to the APS flow rate? Okay, I'll, I'll kick off again. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Yeah, the, the cyclic nature of breathing and just this um, temporal variation in, in flow rate is really, tricky one. Um, as I talked about in the talk, the, the relationship between exhalation flow rate and sampling flow rate is very challenging. Um, this work we carried out, particularly with the breathing in the summer of 2020, and it was um, it, it, it was a challenge at the time. We didn't we didn't have um, we didn't have a, a flow meter at that point to or a, a, a cardiopulmonary exercise testing mask at that point to actually measure the flow rate as a function of time throughout the breathing cycle. So for breathing, we just um, uh, kept the funnel in front of a person's face and, um, and, and enabled that steady state concentration in the funnel to um, hopefully um, lose that uh, cyclic resolution in the concentration and to then just draw directly into the funnel. Um, since that, since the work that Lauren presented was carried out, um, we did have access to a cardiopulmonary exercise testing mask that could measure the flow rate, the minute ventilation flow rate. Um, and that work went more into the exercise um, paper that uh, Lauren showed the reference to at the end of this um, presentation. So there has been a bit more work on that. Um, but yeah, this, this uh, cyclic nature is very complex. And the second part, of the um, and then in terms of measuring the flow rate from the instrument, so you know, as Flo said, all of these measurements that we presented today um, happened over a very short period in the summer of 2020. So since then, we've obviously learned a lot and know um, how we would, what we would like to present, and the data that we would like to get out of these studies. So. Um, as I said, we do have um, a more in-depth um, look um, at some instrumentalists, and during those th that data collection, we did look at the um, the flow rate of those instruments. So we used an anemometer at the um, instrument bell um, to capture the flow rate that was um, being generated. 
but that data okay. is still being worked on. So watch Thank this you. space. Okay. Uh, uh, George in chat asks, will this presentation be available to musicians? Of course, yes. <laughs> I think okay. the link right. will be shared at the end. And so I think everyone can access it. Awesome. Okay, um, I, have, I have one question. Sorry. So at the at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that uh, certain people are uh, like super emitters of uh, particles. I was wondering if we have any idea of like why this uh, difference exists, like between different people and the number of particles they emit. Um, so uh, again, I'll start, but Lauren, chip in if you want to help. We we didn't see any um, any particular reason why certain people seem to emit more than others. It was quite surprising, it's quite striking. Um, we looked across a range of different demographics, um, ages, uh, BMI, ethnicity, um, and types of singing. So different, um, for example, opera versus jazz singing. And um, particularly with the breathing, we really could not see a correlation in, in who was going to emit more and it was quite striking. So it must be some kind of, um, some kind of physiological thing. I don't know if Lauren's got anything else to add. Yeah, I would agree. And also just to say that um, what I didn't mention as part of the SOP is that we would um, have the participant take a sip of water at the beginning of um, the sort of block of activity. Um, and, you know, we made sure that that was um, reproducible across all of the participants. So, I, I, you know, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily anything to do with, um, you know, hydration or um, anything like that. So, yeah, as Flo says, um, we haven't really been able to find um, any particular link between uh, why those people are the high emitters. All right, thank you. Uh, Carl, uh, you've been raising your hand. So if you wanna unmute and ask your question, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. I think I can be understood well. Um, so um, thank you for the presentation. And um, of course, in Germany, we have the same problems and same issues and same questions. And I started with my colleague in 2022, a measurement also in operating theater. And um, yeah, um, well, we took an other um, measurement procedure. So we refused to use panels. Um, mm -hmm. Instead, we, we were building um, a chamber, a closed chamber where no air could um, um go out and finally we could measure the increase of aerosol concentrations um i think you know that study i can post it it was published three weeks ago in scientific report and um in contrast it, it is often in scientific um we found that playing instruments especially of 19 flute players and 11 or both or both players that the emission rates um, were um, significantly higher than from speaking and breathing, um, which is in contrast to your findings. Um, that would mean um, um, much more higher um, um, infection risk in closed rooms um, based on our findings. So I don't want to speak of my study. Everybody can read it now since I posted um, the link in the chat. Um, my questions, um, or well, I would uh, ask two. So our participants played for 20 minutes. As uh, mm -hmm. Flo, you demonstrated perfectly that um, count events are a very important aspect in measuring aerosols because aerosols can be very low and especially air concentrations and um, that yields to long measurement times. So my question is, um, what was the measuring time um, for your um, flute and oboe, uh, flute players and, and wind instrument players? That's my first question. Okay, I think that's uh, more directed to Lauren. Yeah, so um, I think um, all of these were um, 30 seconds of sampling. So obviously very different to your, um, your 20 minutes. I think um, one thing I would say about these measurements is we took them, and we were kind of still learning as we were taking them. So although Flo presented these sampling challenges before the data that we've looked at, I think we learned some of those lessons after we had carried out some of the some of the work. So I think, um, you know, if we were to um, perhaps um, take more measurements, then it probably would be 
um, sensible to sample for a longer period of time. However, we did have the people, um, you know, make many repeats. Um, so I think across the kind of five repeats that we'd get someone to do, we had a few minutes of um, of playing. So, um, so yeah, I'm not sure, Flo, do you have anything to kind of add? Yeah, another, um, thank you, Carl, for sharing your work and for the question. Um, another aspect you talked about is the, um, the enclosed box versus the funnel system. I think uh, with a face breathing or singing or speaking into a funnel, um, it works pretty well at limiting room air mixing. With the bell of an instrument, it's a bit more challenging. We had in, in our work in the, in the study we did two years ago, we had access to a funnel, so we used that. Um, but I think fully enclosing a system to prevent room air mixing entirely is also a very, um, very robust way of measuring this. It's possible discrepancies arise from, from this room air mixing aspect as well. Um, as we have the key holes and everything as uh, we discussed um, earlier already, exactly, yes. So thank you very much for your answer. And my second question is, so you, you um, name one of your main findings is the um, increase in aerosol emission um, um, combined in an increase in sound volume. Do you have a physiological explana explanation for that finding? Um, physiologically speaking, that's not exactly my field, but we did work with respiratory physicians who, um, who advised us on the greater vibrations in the, in the larynx leads to greater droplet generation in the laryngeal mode, um, greater flow rate through the, through the lungs. I suppose this faster flow rate causes more of this fluid film burst mechanism that's generating the, the very smaller droplets. Um, in terms of the larger um, oral mode, we didn't study that quantitatively in this work, um, so I can't comment on, on that exactly, but I suppose that would be the mechanism, unless Lauren has anything else to add. Yeah, I, I would have gone for something like that as well. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we see the importance of um, um, flow rate, rates and um, volume um, as presented earlier, also respiratory rate, since obviously this, this seems to be a very important aspect um, in aerosol emission. Um, since also you call, uh, you named um, 27 liters per minute for singers. Um, one of our main questions, so may also be what the respiratory rate of singers. In our studies, neither, we didn't measure that. But I think, um, as we have seen yet, um, that's a very important aspect. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you. And I just Ansel especially. Add, <laughs> I also just wanted to add the 27 liters per minute um, rate that we quoted. That was just for one single subject in the example I showed. Um, it's likely that the flow rate of a person's singing emission varies drastically depending on the individual as well. Thank you for your questions. Okay, uh, thank you. We're just about out of time, but I have, I have one last very short question in the chat. So did you have any people with asthma or other lung disorders to see what their emissions might be? Um, in parallel to this, this study, the work we've presented today was as part of the PERFORM uh, project, but in parallel to this, um, I also worked on a project called ERATA, which was focusing on sampling aerosol generated through medical procedures. Um, and that was funded uh, through the UK, UKRI NIHR um, funding body. And uh, in that study, um, there, was a, there was a paper that came out after I, after I left, which focused on the, um, on the emission of, um, it, was, it was sampling uh, different types of oxygen delivery systems. Um, sorry, measuring respiratory processes such as peak flow rate and, um, sorry, it's all coming back to me, <laughs> sampling peak flow rate and spirometry. And uh, in that instance, some, as some part of the cohort did have uh, respiratory um, medical conditions like asthma and COPD. So there, is, uh, there, is, there has been some work done on that. Um, I can't remember exactly the conclusion, but there is there has been work on that, not so much in the context of this performed study, but in terms of medical procedures. 
Um, but yeah, you can look up the Aerator project and it will be one of those papers. Okay, uh, thank you. That's uh, all the time we have today. So thank you, Dr. Gregson and Ms. Uh, McCarthy for presenting. Uh, thank you for all of our participants for coming and asking questions. And um, unless uh, one of my co-hosts wants to do an outro, I, I think that's all we have today. Great, thank you so much. Right. Thank, thank you. you.